Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today we are doing inlaid dovetails. Now on the last live, last week, uh, we got this far. We actually inlaid the inlay dovetail into the main stock, but now we want to actually put the secondary or the actual stock into it. Uh, so this white oak that's in between will be turning into the inlay in between. If you don't know what I'm talking about, um, you can go back and watch the live stream from last week. Uh, I'll leave a link to that down below once this is over. <laughs> Otherwise, if you go to woodbyright.com um, and search for, not woodbyright.com, but woodbyright YouTube, and you search for uh, inlaid dovetails, you'll find it there. And if you don't know, if you're ever wondering, did he ever do a video on that? If you go to my main channel page, there's a little search up in the top right corner where you can search through the videos to see if there's a, a video on the topic you're looking for. One of those tips that I like to give people. So um, we're going to have some fun here. We have this big blocky piece on here. And what we need to do is turn this board back into just a standard board with a regular end so that we can make a regular dovetail onto there. But uh, yeah, that's a mess. So let's clean this up. Um, first thing I'm gonna be doing is grabbing a saw, clamping this in place, and let me flip this one so you can see something that's completely out of focus. Oh, that's probably coming. Oh, that's pretty close to focus. Look at that. Hey, better than I thought it was. Uh, take this down. There we go. So I need to cut this block off of here. And there's a couple different ways I can do it. Number one, I can put it in the vise this way, and I can cut down this way. Um, which works fairly well as long as you have a line to strike to. Uh, number two, I can put it in the vise this way and cut here, but if I'm cutting with a back saw, that's going to turn it at an angle, and I'm actually going to start cutting at an angle back that way. Um, or I can put it up in the vise this way and cut down like I normally would, but it's really hard to clamp something that way. Uh, so what I can do is put it in the vise here, oops, excuse me, put it in the vise this way, and clamp down and cut right down, but I don't have a line to follow to. And so this really becomes a, a complicated thing that confuses people, how do you make that first cut? Um, so what I like to do is grab a marking gauge, and I'm going to actually mark in how far I need to go. Because I haven't smoothed this off, well number one, I could smooth this off first and clean that up, but I like to do all the smoothing at one time. So I'm gonna set my marking gauge to the thickness I want, and I actually wanna set it a little bit larger, because I can always take off material um, so if I set it to the thickness of this board, if this pin is sticking out, then I'm going to be cutting too far this way. So I actually want to move the pin farther in. So I'm going to make it a sixteenth of an inch or so larger than it needs to be. Set that there. And now I can make a mark here, make a mark here, and follow that mark all the way around. Oops, sorry, I'm out of focus, aren't I? There we go. And now we have a line that we can cut to. Move this over a little bit. There we go. Now I can grab the saw and just like any other normal cut, cut down that line. How's the live chat doing so far? Good. We're not telling that half of them are at work and shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. <laughs> so for those of you in Europe, uh, I hope you like doing it at this time. Um, we have a South African tune that makes me super happy. Woohoo! Yeah, Sarah spent a year in South Africa. Yep. We'll cut down the other side. Ooh, making a mess of it. I'll steer that cut a little bit better. That's what happens when I change up my body mechanic. Okay, I made a mistake. Rushing in. Let me see if I can zoom in on this for you. And I let the saw veer a little off to the side. Oh well, at least it's on the inside of the box and not the outside of the box. But uh, yeah, I was rushing too fast on that. Oh well. Let's clean this up. So now we need to smooth this side down, smooth this side down, smooth this side down, basically turn it back into a regular squared end on the board. So for that, I'm gonna put it in here. Up a little bit. Man, it's hard to do backwards. Actually, I'm just going to cut this off because it's a little bit thicker than it needs to be. So it'll be fairly easy to cut. Drop that out of the way. And cut this down. Making 
sure I don't take off too much again. Like that. Now we can plane this all down nice and smooth. Now on this, I'm actually planing the end grain of the walnut and a cross grain on the uh, white oak. And I want to be careful when I'm pushing a cross grain. I don't want to push out this far side here and splinter off the fibers that are running across right here in the corner. Put that in a little closer for you. There we go. Any questions so far? Um, <laughs> no, but I'm getting lots of bad dad jokes. The best kind. <laughs> Just smooth it down to the walnut, and then I do want to come back through and check for square. Make sure that I'm staying where I want to stay. And I'm actually a little out of square. So let's clean that up right now. This side's a little higher, so I'm spending a little time here. And then I'm taking my stroke a little longer and a little longer until I get down to the other side. That should about clean it up. Yes, it's perfect. That's what I'm looking for. Now, I'm going to clean off this face here. Actually, no, first I'm going to clean off this because this is sticking out a little farther. Just make it easier on the next one. Had a, a few people ask me why I don't pick the plane up every time and bring it back. Uh, because you are actually dulling the blade a little bit when you drag it backwards. But dulling the blade a little bit it's not a huge issue. There we go. Just means you get to have more practice sharpening. And good that way. Cool. So now, let's do it this way. And in a moment here, we're basically going to have an exact board that we had before. But then the magic happens of actually cutting the inlay into it. Um, actually, this one I'm going to use my low angle because I'm cutting the end grain of the white oak. And I want to be very careful because these white oak pieces are so small. And I'm not focusing on the right thing here. There we go. These white oak pieces are so small that it's easy to break them off. And I don't want to do that. So right now they're just held in by the glue. So I'm, I'm just planing this way so that the walnut still supports their fibers. I get them close and then I'm going to come in with my smoothing plane just smooth them out one or two strokes now it's nice and smooth feeling right here there you go that feels smooth all the way across do the same thing on the other side the side that was totally messed up I don't know who in their right mind would cut that horribly but <laughs> It happens, it really does. Um, especially when you're trying to rush and go too fast. But such is life. You gotta get used to making mistakes, move on. Mistakes are normal on the path to perfection. like you're only gonna see a little bit of that cut problem and it's all done and you only see it on the inside of the box so no problem right right I have a couple of questions cool can it be James he's um actually just before I do this let me actually go through and explain the next step fine because this is the magic of inlaid dovetails is now that we have this stock in here we basically have a regular board uh, let's see, which way did I hit this? Okay, so I'm going to try and do a continuous grain wrap all the way around because this is the board I cut off of that one. I want to then socket this into this. So it's going to be basically like regular dovetails, except for I still need to cut the tails out of this. And I'm going to make the tails a little bit bigger than they used to be, and I'm not going to cut all the way down. So I'm going to come in here with uh, calipers, not calipers, um, dividers, there's the word, and I want to figure out 
what, how wide do I want that inlay to be? And so I can set my dividers at that, which is around an eighth inch or so. And I'm going to come in on all sides. I'm going to put a point that far in on all sides. And this gives me a point to cut to. There, there, there. And then we're also going to do the same thing on the bottom here. And on the side here, that just gives me an eyeball of, okay, that's about how wide I want this to be. And now we can use those to cut down. And so I'm going to use a square to draw a line across on the tops of these. And so I'm going to, I have that point. I'm going to put my knife into that point. Sorry, my camera's in the way. My hand is in the way of my camera. Move this down for you a little bit. There we go. So I'm going to put my knife into that hole I just created with the divider, slide the square up against it, draw a mark across the top, and do the same thing at each of those. And that will give me my cut down. The next thing I need to create is a depth stop. I'll show you that in a minute. So what questions we got? Uh, let's see. Um, Jerry Doyen, Diane. James, do you have to worry about blowout? I'm assuming it's supposed to be planing the end of the board. Do yes. You need to chamfer the edges depending on the situation. You can chamfer the edge, um, especially on this one. I, I don't worry about blowout on this because I'm going to be removing this piece in a little bit. Uh, this corner will be taken off, so I don't worry about the blowout on that. Um, on some of the points, I will worry about blowout, but most of the time you just be careful. That's like on the inside here, I don't want to plane across this way. Otherwise, I'm going to blow out the small fibers down here I want. That's why I'm going to plane into the board so that the walnut is still supporting the fibers sticking out here. But planing across the end here, I don't worry as much about blowout here because I'm going to be removing this piece anyway. So if anything chips off of there, oh well, no problem. Um, where did my marking get? Oh, there it is. The other thing I want to do is set, I want to have a depth stop all the way across here. So that point I put in, I'm going to put my marking gauge mark into that hole, slide this down, lock it in place. And now I can create a depth stop that I can cut down to. Oop. There and there. I want to mark it all the way across the back. And now I have my lines that I can cut to. Now, if I were using a dovetail jig and I cut the original one with it, I pull it out here and use that to cut the same way. But because I cut these completely freehand, I'm just going to eyeball those cuts. I'm going to set my saw in here and I'm going to angle it. Just do a small kerf to hold the blade. And then I'm going to angle it until it matches that cut and cut straight down to the depth cut, the depth mark. <laughs> And then repeat it for the other cuts. Any questions? Um, cut this in just a little bit more. See. If you do have a problem with it, come back, clean it up, use the side of the teeth just to angle it a little bit. Are you ready? Yep. Early Woodworks asks, have you had any problems with the chisel at all? I've been wanting to make one for myself to try out one of the dovetails you're doing. The chisel. Oh, are you talking about the dovetail chisel that was made a while ago? Um, no. Actually, anything? I really enjoy that one. Um, I don't use it as much for regular dovetails, but if I'm doing half-blind dovetails or I have to get back into a socket corner, um, that's where I pull it out most commonly. Um, but for regular dovetails, I just use my normal bench chisels. Although some people are going to scream at me for that because they want me to use bevel edge chisels. <laughs> questions um yes brian rust asks let's say the top of your board is not square it has an angle to it do you angle your plane and take shavings off the high end high side or do you hold it flat and just add more pressure to the one side no i only like if if i have, if I have an angle to it and it's high over here I'm going to do a couple stro small strokes here, 
and then I'll do a couple longer strokes, and I'll do a couple longer strokes, and I'll do a couple longer strokes until I get one stroke that goes all the way across the board. Um, that way I'm taking off more material here, a little bit less, a little bit less, and almost nothing on the far end. So there, now we've cut down. Now I need to cut in from the sides. So I'll pull this up, set that in there, and I'm going to draw a square line across here. So I can cut to that. Do basically the exact same thing, only this time I'm cutting a straight line. And while I have it here, I'm just going to bring in the chisel and clean out any chunks or anything that's in here. Anything that would be a slight pain or anything that needs to be removed. Make that look nice. Flip it over, do the other side. Any other questions so far? Nope. Woohoo! Oh, this, uh, doing it at this time of the day is really weird. But uh, let me know what you guys think. If you want me to do it this time of the day more often or just to do them all at 7 o'clock. I don't know. a little bit and then we're going to get to the really fun part one of the parts that I love about doing inlaid dovetails is removing the waste in between the tails as a lot of people are thinking oh grab a coping saw and clean that out but uh, with this this is actually really easy because you're working with the grain now I can grab my chisel and grab my smaller one nah it's not let's grab this one and a mallet oh down the floor there we are and because we're going with the grain, I can set this in here and go tap, and these blocks just pop out. No worry about peeling in, no worry about cleaning out. And so I take it back close to the line, not into the line yet. And now I'm going to go right into that line, tap it straight down. Over here, clean that one. And we're going to stand it up and clean all that out. Make sure that we've gone to the line on both sides. I don't know why, but I find that very enjoyable to clean out along the grain like that. Um, especially on the bigger ones like I did on that box last week. That was very fun. <laughs> I do have a sen twisted sense of fun, don't I? Mm-hmm. Yeah, talk to my wife about uh, working out. Typing is hurting today. <laughs> Those forearm muscles feeling good, babe? My gosh. Now we're doing CrossFit because running she is doing... 31 miles at a time wasn't enough. Well, <sighs> she's a glutton for punishment. She married me. Kids. The guy who does things the hard way. Yeah. Cool. Now... We've got this all ready to go. <clears throat> now, what I could do is let me make sure that this is running right, like that, because I have the grain wrapping. So I need to then put this into there, but I have the thickness of the inlay here that I need into that. So I'm going to need to do that same rabbit that I did on this board onto this board as well. So I'm going to set up our marking gauge. Oop, I need to clean that up a little bit first. Just notice that there's some fibers where they shouldn't be. Right over here. When you're ready for a question, let me know. Oh, go for it. Um, Armandillo asks, is there a rule of thumb you use for the inlay size or just whatever you feel would look good at the time? Whatever you feel looks good. And if you want, because um, I'm just doing a single, lane of, a single line of inlay around here. And if you want, you can do two or three or four lines of inlay. And it's just about going back and doing it again. Um, so put another board in there. And so some people will do like maple walnut maple. Um, so you get that, that contrast line. Um, some people are crazy though, like me, I guess. Uh, which direction was it? It was that way. So next thing I need to do is I need to cut in a rabbit here. And I need to know how deep to cut in that rabbit because this is going to go 
onto there, I need this to be this thickness. So number one, let's grab that thickness with the marking gauge. Now that I have that thickness, I can bring that onto here. Mark that right there. Just a little bit down here, a little bit down here. And now I need to know how deep down to go. And that depth is measured by the depth from here to the inlay. So let's take the marking gauge again, set it on that inlay line. Just make sure that's what I want. Yes, yes, yes. So then I can bring that on here and I can make that line. So I need to cut in that deep. That is my rabbit size. And again, there are a bunch of different ways to cut a rabbit. I could grab a rabbit plane. I could grab a saw and chisel, which is what I'm gonna do. That's my, ooh, that's loud. Gotta grab my uh, hold fast. And so I'm going to set this in here, give it a good whack. Ooh. Well, that's interesting. Let's move it over here then. Just drilled a new dog hole, so it's not quite where I wanted it. Um, where did my knife go? Why am I scatterbrained this morning? What's up with that? It's morning time. It's morning. Oh. You're not a <laughs> Oh, I am not a morning person. This is just like... Nutso to me. The day does not begin until afternoon. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to deepen this line a little bit that I create with that. Could get out the square and make it perfect, but there's actually a bit of a crease that it follows in nicely. Then I want to grab a chisel, create a knife wall along here. The knife wall just gives it a place for the saw to rest, making it very easy to cut down to depth. Don't really need it, but... Uh, there's a lot of things in life that you don't need, but you, you do need. And then that gives me a place I can set the saw in that cut. What do you think you need cut now? Down to the depth. What's that? So what do you think you need now? More of you. Yeah. Oh, come on. That hole's not grabbing the way I want it to. Not very deep. Just a little bit, go deeper on the back side. There we go. And now we can pair that out. And I don't want to go all the way down to the line. I want to go about halfway down. Maybe a little bit more than halfway on this one. Because the grain's going well. And pair in, pop out those pieces. Go down a little more. Getting close to the line here. The key is you want to stay, you want to have as little material above the line because the less material there, the easier it is to control, the easier it is to get a nice clean cut. Like that. One, into the line. And the last one. Keep that a little high. High is better than low. I'm just gonna clean that out a little bit. Then I could bring in the, the uh, router plane and make sure everything is precise. Which, if I'm working on a bigger piece, I usually do. But in a small one like this, no need to. So now, we're ready to put this into this. So we have that shoulder in there. We just need to transfer those lines from one to the other. So let's get rid of that. So I'm going to put this in the vise. Grab, um, I like to use a block plane here. And I'm going to set the block plane to the same height as this board. So just loosen it up a little bit so there's still a little bit of friction in the vise. 
and it allows you to move this around. Get that to a nice height there. And what that does is it allows you to move this farther away and keep this parallel to the bench. So I can set that on there. Keep this smooth out here. Grab my marking knife and lay out those lines. Try and make sure nothing moves. Don't put more pressure on the knife than you need. Doesn't take much at all to mark the end grain. And before moving it too far away, I'm going to pull this out here. I'm going to put an X. I'm going to put an X. That's what I want to remove. Now the next thing I need is a depth stop mark. How deep down do I go? And that depth is measured by the thickness of this tail. So I can bring my marking gauge over again. Set it up to the thickness of that tail. Right to there. Lock it down. Check it. Cool. Then we can put in a depth mark here, which theoretically should be the same depth as the shoulder we cut on the back side, which it is. So that's nice. Make sure everything is the way I want it that way. Yes. Perfect. That's what I'm looking for. So now we can cut down. Well, before I cut down, I actually want to cut. Um, anytime that something is a really nice square line, Unless I'm using a, a guide, I actually want to use a square on here to have a line for my eye to follow. And these outside ones I can actually parallel <laughs> the outside, but this one I just want to have a line here. My, my wife is laughing behind my back. They're talking the about my time. typing and probably my speed compared to your speed because it sounds apparently like popcorn. Oh, yeah. No, my typing speed is like... Measured in words per minute. Per hour. <laughs> yeah, per day, something like that. Hers is, is not. <laughs> it's from all those piano lessons. Yes. So now we can do the same thing over again and uh, cut down along that line we just hit, making sure we're staying on the right side of the line. We want to be in the line where the X is. I'm just going to start with a... <laughs> Kerf there. I'm going to put a kerf on each of these. I like to start with that kerf just because it gives your saw a place to be. Especially if I'm using a guide, like the Cat's Moses guide. Um, that kerf just gets the saw in the right place. Then I'll put the saw in the kerf, slide the guide up against it, um, and that will make it, make it much easier to hold on to. Oops. Sorry. Try that. So when you are ready for a couple of questions, sure. let me know. Okay, because I apparently had missed some earlier in the chat. Um, see, Burley Works had asked, when you get gaps from uneven fitting, is there a way to fix those or blend them in so they're less noticeable? There are ways to fix them. But the question is, why do you want to fix them? Gaps are proof that you're learning. That... Uh, you haven't reached perfection, which doesn't exist. Um, usually, I leave my gaps alone. I don't like to fill them. Uh, this is my personal preference. But most of the time, you can fill them with a piece of ingrain. And maybe I'll show you that when we get to the end. But if you get a piece of the ingrain material um, and shove that down in the crack, so like all these little splinter pieces you stick off. So if I had white oak ingrain I was trying to fill, I could then drive that down in. Uh, walnut's a pretty easy one to, to uh, hide. White oak is a harder one to hide because you have medullary arrays that, are, that pop up. That one's good. Check that. Good. One more. And these will not be perfect dovetails, not by a long strap. Uh, when I really want to be perfect, I'm focusing a lot more and not talking as much. When I talk, things go wrong. What's that, babe? What? I wasn't even listening. No, you got. Do you have another question? I do. Sorry, I was okay. trying to catch up on there. But for some reason, oh, there it goes. Half of the words weren't coming through. Okay, Alan Smith had a question. Where did it go? It was about a puzzle. 
Oh, I had it and then I tried catching up. Oh, has James made a round type dovetail like a puzzle piece? I saw one and it looked amazing, but the curves looked hard to make uniform. Thoughts? Um, I have not done one of those. They're actually done with uh, drill bits. Ooh, and making the hole is not a problem, but making the outside is because you have to scroll saw to it. Um, I, I've thought about doing one of those. I, I just have not. They're much easier to do with power tools. Uh, that's that's a, a whenever you see those puzzle piece dovetails, you pretty much know that they were done with a with a power tool. Um, what am I looking for? Chisel. There we are. Let me grab a different one though. Uh, but yeah, maybe I should do those. That would be a fun video sometime. Now we're gonna do the same thing again. Uh, chop in close to the line, and I'm starting on the side without the rabbit. So the bottom is on, the rabbit's on the bottom, and that way when I actually remove the piece. It'll be flat on the bench. And so I'm just going to go across here, across here, and then after cutting in, then we can pair out the waist. Any questions? Yes, Burley Woodworks wants to know if we have any plans for the channel now that you're nearing 100,000 <laughs> followers. I don't have any 100,000 plans right now. Um, it was kind of one of my goals to do that by my birthday, which is uh, February 14th. Um, I don't think I'm going to make that. It would be a, a hard one, but we'll oh, see. Oh, come on, guys. We can make it happen. <laughs> but I hit 80,000 yesterday, so whoo-hoo. Um, yeah, I don't know. If any of you have any fun ideas for 100,000, let me know. We'll see. Uh, Got to fix that hole for the hold fast. It keeps popping out on me. Not a huge issue, but that's the way things are. Let's just do it this way. Don't need any particular stuff. I just need something to keep it from moving away from me. And so it's a lot of chop down, pair out, chop down, pair out. Um, but when I'm down about halfway or so, I'm going to then go back to that line and chop down tight to that line. And then we can flip it over and do the exact same from the other side. Then we're ready to fit these together and you get to see the magic of the inlay pop out. Woohoo! Almost there! So now we're down, let's go into that marking gauge line. Chop down. Any questions? Oh, I thought there was. Um... Oh, well, 63 degrees north just noticed the creepy looking statuette in the corner. So he just saw Tychicus. So you have Tychus? to give... But did I say it wrong? Yes. I always throw the other syllable. That's uh, that's Tychus. He's my shop supervisor. Uh, uh, old uh, history from one of my previous jobs on uh, stage. The uh, the crew who I supervised gave him to me when we left, and it was a, a running gag on the stage there. So a lot of good memories. But yeah, take us as his own Facebook page, too. Um, I don't think anything's been put on it in like four or five years. But. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to flip it over. And because I have this shoulder here, I'm actually not going to stay away from the line. I'm going to start right in that line, which is the shoulder. And chop down. A couple taps, a couple taps, pair out. Oh. Any questions? Um, let's see. There was a comment. Jeremy Baker says, I enjoy your channel. Where did you study or learn your craft? Um, ever since I was about five years old, I've been in the wood, craft, wood shop with my dad. Uh, we've had a wood shop just about every place we've lived. Um, but I've been power tools almost all my life until a few years ago I switched to all hand tools um, because of becoming a stay-at-home dad. And so... This is, the hand tools are a little bit newer thing for me, but it's been kind of nice because I've been learning the art of woodworking all over again because it's a, in many ways, a very different art than uh, working with power tools because you have to actually learn the wood. Whereas with power tools, you can forget about the grain and a lot of what you do, whereas with hand tools, you can't. 
So yeah, it's uh, been almost 30 years now that I've been woodworking in one way or another. Almost there. There we go. There's that piece. One more. One more. And last one. There. Now, I can clean this out and see how she fits. And with every dovetail, if it's hand cut, it is a very, very rare thing indeed that it fits right off the saw like that. This one will not, I promise you that. Um, so don't be afraid if they don't. Um, this one is really tight here in the middle. I'm, you can see how it's slipping here and slipping here, so I have a good fit there, but I'm really tight on that pin. So I can adjust the pin or I can adjust the tails. In this case, I'm going to adjust the tails because I'm looking at this and my inlay is just a little bit uneven. So that'll give me a good chance to clean that up. So I'm going to come in here and pare down. And some people are very picky that you have to adjust the tails or you have to adjust the pins. Um, you can adjust either of them. You just have to know where to adjust them to make the fit better, which is a bit of a learning skill. Okay, getting wedged there. So let's see, which one is that? It's that side. And so what I'm doing is I'm putting it in here and I'm seeing if there's any um, compression in the fibers here. If I'm seeing, is it wiggling in some places and not in others? So as I move it side to side, I can see if one pin moves and the other one doesn't. Um, I could also come in and tap them and that gives you a good idea about where the fit is good and where it is not. So I'm just going to clean this one out a little bit. But we're getting really close here. I think I'm actually going to bring in a file. Yeah. I think I'm just going to file clean it out and we'll be good to go there. So, this one. The file just allows you to take that little bit off as well as smooth the joint out because the smooth joint always glues better. Let me do this one as well. And this one. Yeah, we're doing well on time. I thought we were farther along. There we go. That's what I'm looking for right there. Inlaid dovetails. So you can see how that comes out. And by Jove, we have a bit of a gap here. So maybe we'll fix that. I'll show you guys what I do for that. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Back that out. Now it's just glue up and put in and you have your inlay there. And sometimes you're gonna have these little gaps here. Actually, no, that one's just uh, not pushed down all the way. Once it's down all the way, it fits in. Uh, sometimes you have little gaps there that once you glue it and plane it, the gaps disappear. So you don't wanna worry about your gaps until after you've glued and planed it up. Um, but in this case, I have this one here, which is a rather big gap. Um, yeah, that's a bad one. Uh, I don't know what I did there, but I think, I think either my caliper moved or my saw was on the wrong side of the line. Actually, that probably looks like, let me show you this up a little closer. How often do you get to be on YouTube and see a close-up of dovetail problems? <laughs> but yeah, this gap actually looks like I cut on the wrong side of the line with my saw, which I may very well may have, because it's about the same kerf thickness as my saw plate. Um, so yeah, how do you fix gaps? Uh, this would be a good point to, to put that in there. Um, what you can do is in this case, this walnut here is in grain, and the oak here is in grain, and it's hard to match oak because oak has these medullary rays and lines that go through that make it very difficult to line up. Um, but with walnut, it's a fairly easy one to match. So I'm going to put this in here. And bring this around so you guys can see this a little better. And so what I'm going to do is particularly all these little pieces that I shaved off when I was cutting the rabbit. Look at that. That's just about what I need. So I can take that, and when I glue it up, I'll jam that down in there. And I'm just going to leave it rough like that when it's all glued up. And then I can come back and plane it off. And when I plane it off, well, here, let me see if I can shave it off for you. 
It's easier to do when it's planed. And I'm not going to plane it without gluing it. Let me see what I can do here. Oh, wow, you're dull. I need to get a different chisel. Oh, I sharpened you the other day, didn't I? Yes. So now you can see how, especially once it gets planed, that gap basically disappears there. And so you've got a nice filled clean. Um, I don't like using wood filler because wood filler just doesn't look right in, in gaps as much. Um, but sometimes putting that end grain in there cleans it all up, uh, especially if you can match the color of it. You can see how that comes out. So there you go. Inlaid dovetails. Got any questions? Um, hang on. Maybe I should glue this up while I'm waiting. It's not going to take me that long. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm <laughs> sorry. So anyways, um, Armandillo asks, how do you fix hold fast holes that don't hold? Um, there are a bunch of different problems with hold fast holes, um, especially if you have a thick hardwood top. Um, thick hardwood top means that there isn't enough space for this to move side to side in the hole. Um, so number one, you can, you, you can work on your, your hold fast. And you can see on these ones, because uh, I have a four and a half inch thick top. Um, oop, I have nicks on the back here, and then on the inside here, I've just taken a file. And where did I put my file? Did I put it away? I must have put it away. I just take the file and I nick it like that, and that helps it hold in the, in the hole better. Um, sometimes, with the holes, um, if you are doing finish on your bench and oil or wax get down into the hole, that makes the hole more slippery so that these don't slide in as much. Um, so sometimes I'll take a rat, rat, uh, rat tail file and I'll run down the hole and clean out the hole a little bit. Um, sometimes the holes are just too tight. If you, if you have a, a hold fast that's designed for three quarter inch, so if you have a three quarter inch hold fast, it's actually smaller than three quarter inch. It's designed to fit into a three quarter inch hole, so this is a um, like a, a sixteenth inch smaller than three quarter. Um, but sometimes with a thick top, three quarter inches isn't quite big enough. So you might bump up a sixteenth inch in your hole um, and make the hole a little bit larger. That gives you a little more space for it to cantilever. Um, so th there's a bunch of different problems with that. If you're working with a softwood top, it's rare that these have a problem. With like my, my pine bench, I put this in any hole and it holds like solid. Um, this one, I have a few here. So I just drilled a couple holes here that are still too smooth. Um, I just drilled them, um, and then I have a cup. I have one over here that I dumped boiled linseed oil down through, and so that one's going to take me a while to clean out. So I'm just getting to know my holes. Some of them hold perfectly every time, um, but the ones here I just need to work on a little bit more because those are probably the ones I use more than any other. But yeah, there's a bunch of different things. Um, another thing you can do is you can bore out the inside of the hole larger, uh, so from underneath. Um, some people will use a taper bit and make it um, bigger on the bottom. But basically what that does is that decreases the thickness of the top um, in that hole so that there is less contact space in the holdfast. Um, and so in my opinion, the perfect thickness for a hardwood top is about two and a half inches. Uh, so if you drill the hole in the bottom about one inch diameter up you know, an inch or two, and then you have a three quarter inch hole going the rest of the way, um, that makes it easier to get the holdfast in because there's less bench for it to um, have a problem with. So, yeah, a bunch of different ideas. That sounds like a really good video topic, though. I'm going to do that. Thanks. All right. Your mom wants you to say hi to um, Ezekiel and Leslie. Oh, Ezekiel, how's it going? Um, over from, uh, from uh, Cameroon. Yes, they're staying with my parents, so. <laughs> Welcome to the U.S. again. <laughs> and then <clears throat> Burley Woodworks asks, do I see a forged clamp? A forged clamp. I don't know. It was a little while ago. Uh, I don't know if I have a forged clamp. I mean, other than the holdfast, they're forged. Um, these are actually from um, Blackburn Toolworks. Uh, Blackburn Forge, excuse me. Uh, I really like his stuff. Not Blackburn. Uh, Black Bear. I was going to say, who are you? <laughs> Blackburn makes saws. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, he. I really like his holdfast. They're just gorgeous. And if you're getting a hold holdfast... Don't get the cheap ones that are cast. Those are the ones you get on Amazon uh, because they snap. Um, the ones from Gramercy are heat bent, but they still have a smooth shaft. 
and I, I've had some problems with them not holding quite as well. Whereas a, hor a forged hold fast has all these little divots make it hold fairly well. Um, this is about the hardest bench um, I've ever had to have a hold fast in because it is such a thick top of hardwood. Um, and most of the other ones, I just cannot get them to work on this bench, whereas these will. Um, so yes, um, get a good forged hold fast. It's worth the money. All right. Um, Nathaniel Stuver says, so what would you buy if you had a set of three chisels from box stores, files from Walmart, and a cheap back saw and only $50 asking for a friend? Um, uh, the only other thing you need is a plane. Um, once you have a plane, then you can make anything. That's, that's where you're at is basically where I started um, building my workbench. That's, um, <laughs> I had, I had, a, uh, I had a, um, a, a cheap handsaw that I got from a big box store with hardened teeth, plastic handle. Um, I had a, a set of Harbor Freight chisels. Um, and then I got a plane, a number four that I, could, I restored um, I think I spent like five or six bucks on it. I had $12 total in my, my shop worth of tools, and I started working on the bench. Um, now, I didn't stop there because you, 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 you don't stop there. I mean, you're getting tools. <laughs> but yeah, looking for a plane is the best way to go. And for $50, um, you're, you're going to be looking at restoring a, restoring a plane. And I have an entire video on where do you find hand tools. Uh, so you can go there. And I have a resource on my website. So if you go to woodbyright.com, um, and go up to the top, click Tools. There is a site on there where you can go to, and I have a map of the entire world of all the places I know of where you can find hand tools. And so I'm, I'm regularly adding to that map, and I'd like to add more to it. So, yeah, definitely go look there. All right, hang on. I'm, la, 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 I'm la, hanging. La, I'm la, hanging. La. Where did where did it go? Go? Your computer like keeps cutting in out letters, so then I see half the phrase. All right, so from Armandillo again. I don't currently have much of a shop to use, but I want to start my three-year-old daughter with wood when the weather warms in the spring. I'm thinking maybe a spoke shave work to start them. Thoughts? Yeah, a spoke shave is a, a great project. Uh, Paul Sellers actually did a, a series, oh man, I want to say like five or six years ago on Christmas gifts. Um, it wasn't a series, it was a single video. And so he did one video on tools to get the beginner woodworker and one of the tools of the spoke shave um, and then he did a video a, a little while later he did like three quick mm -hmm. projects that you can make with those basic tools um, and one of those was actually I'm going to show you guys something that's a little early this will be coming out next week um, or possibly Thursday this week I'm not sure but I made a uh, handheld helicopter so that you can <laughs> don't you want to fly with me and I'm a pilot <laughs> helps if I go the right direction I was forcing it down um, but you can actually make one of these with a spoke shave really quickly and really easily um, and Paul Sellers has uh, that's one of the things that he had on his video um, I'm making a rendition on mine it's slightly different but it's basically just a spoke shave a piece of pine or in this case walnut um, and a dowel and you can make a toy very quickly and you can make one of these in literally you know 15 20 minutes if that um, so a fun little thing you can make there's a bunch of different projects like that um, yeah definitely check out Paul Sellers oh, I like his stuff there um, trying to think of what other things. Making a toolbox. Um, I have a video on that where I made a toolbox for the kids so that they have a place that they can put their tools. Uh, it's kind of a nice thing so that they can, uh, it's something that's theirs and they can work on it. And especially in something uh, like I, you know, I actually have plans for free on my website where you can see the design of the toolbox. It's just made with dowels. So if you have a brace and bit um, and some dowels and trimming up boards, then you can use a spoke shave to uh, um, chamfer the corners and make everything feel good. Uh, that's a, a great project to do with kids. So, yeah. Uh, where did it go? I'm right here. You don't usually refer to you as it, but sure. <laughs> you don't? <laughs> <laughs> now you're not a creepy clown. Anyways, <laughs> Benedict Biltz, for filling gaps, how do you feel about using sawdust from the wood you've been working with mixed with a bit of glue? It looks like sawdust and glue shoved into a gap. I, I've just never been a fan of that method. I, I, I've never seen it done well, and I've never seen it look right. Um, just a personal preference. A lot of people really like that idea of mixing up the fine powder sawdust with it and rubbing it in. Uh, the problem with that is if you use a PVA glue, um, it 
it does not absorb finish. And so, especially if you're working with something like walnut or something with a lot of color, it stands out as a bright thing of mess that the glue isn't absorbing any of the finish. Um, now, if you use a hide glue, a hide glue does a far better job of letting the finish absorb in. And so in that case, high glue with a little bit of sawdust works well, but high glue is often hot and it can burn your finger. <laughs> uh, my, my personal preference is just using small scraps, um, pieces that you've shaved off with a chisel. They work really well and it's the exact same wood, uh, especially with the end grain, they, they disappear and you just really can't see it. Uh, if you want to see a full detailed video on that, uh, Shannon Rogers on the Hand Tool School, um, Renaissance Woodworker on YouTube, uh, he has an entire video dedicated to filling gaps and dovetails um, and shows how to do it very quickly and it is in my opinion the best method because it, it, they disappear you, you cannot see them once they've cleaned up uh, especially if you get a good uh, wood match so you pulled the same chips off of the same piece of wood uh, they, they disappear it's gorgeous stuff all right let's see mini growl says i have a shop Whoa. in the <laughs> in the garage right now but my wood stove is not functioning properly, so I cannot keep it warm in there. Would you recommend moving my wood shop into my basement? Oh, yes. The wood <laughs> shop in the basement is such a nice thing, um, especially if you're hand tools, because the dust isn't a problem in the house. The noise isn't a problem in the house. Um, it is, it's phenomenal because it's, it's air conditioned. It's heated. The shop is always the same temperature. It's always a very similar humidity. Oh, the wood stays stable. And it's so much easier to work in. You don't have to heat it up in the winter. You don't have to cool it down in the summer. Uh, I, I really like the basement shop. The only thing I don't like about the basement shop is the, the ceiling right here um, and the vent that's only an inch above my head. Um, <laughs> but yeah, those are the things you can, you can work around and, and um, a basement shop is a phenomenal thing. Um, if I had power tools, I would probably revamp the garage into a power tool shop. Um, but for hand tools, the basement is phenomenal. Yeah, my personal opinion. <laughs> All right, um, 63 degrees north says, question, I just got a full set of like new cutters for a Stanley 55 to use with my Veritas combination plane, plane Yippee. Mm -hmm. Any great ideas for blade storage options? Um, I actually like the, the original tool uh, boxes that, that Stanley made for them. Um, they store really well because I can actually file them away here. Let me show you this a little closer. Uh, and they're, they're not that difficult to make uh, as long as you have some thin stock. Let's do that right over there. Okay. Uh, so they're about a half inch thick. And you have uh, this piece here. And these, the original ones, they actually made them out of a solid piece wrapping around. Um, and so you can see this piece is the same piece that goes all the way around here. And so they grooved out with a saw that thickness and then put these shims in to support it. And so it's just this box here. But you could do it with a... Pan, uh, panel wood there, panel wood there, and then a piece of wood running all the way around inside that is um, slightly more than the thickness of the, the blades. What? We had two super chats, so I was trying to watch the lava lamp to see if it would do oh, anything. Oh, hey, really the lava on. lamp turned on. But it's not <laughs> doing a whole lot. One of the new things I'm playing with, uh, super chats turning on, uh, different things here, so the, the lava lamp turned on. So thank you for the super chat. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, so I, I really like these boxes, and you can do the exact same thing with the top, just a smaller piece that then is out of focus, um, and then fits on top there. And then these are make it very easy so that you can actually sort them together on the rack here, and I just have mine filed in with this. It's way blurry, honey. It's what? It's blurry. Oh, sorry. There we go. So I can just keep these sorted on here and I can pull out any one of them at a time and then have all those blades. And if you really want to get fancy, these labels, um, you can actually find those online, print them off and glue them on so you can see all your blades labeled and what the numbers are. Um, so this is how I keep all of my 55 and 45 irons. I, I like the design. Um, I've thought about doing a tool roll. Uh, where did my clicker go? No, sir. Where did my clicker go? I didn't in there. Did you eat my clicker? You didn't leave it over here, did you? Earlier? No, I, oh, there it is. It flipped upside down. Couldn't see the black. <laughs> um, I have seen people make tool rolls, so just like having a, a chisel roll, so you can slide all those in and roll them up. They work really well. So, 
So who turned on my lava lamp? Let's see. Make Brooklyn and Mama Bear she's shit. She shed. She shed. She shed. Tracy? Tracy Keaton. Say that ten times fast. Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm playing with a bunch of different things and, and trying to do because I can was now hoping do like a siren was gonna go off with the blue light. Uh, um, no, no, the blue light's on a different one. Oh. Because I have I have like five things in here for different super chats that can turn on. Um, so I'm I'm playing with a couple different things for super chat of making the shop a little more fun. So if you I'm still a little right disappointed now. that um you're not dancing. Oh. <laughs> 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 Welcome to Woodward Right, where we do stupid, crazy things and uh, turn on lava lamps. <laughs> okay, hang on. There are more questions, but what's that? My com the computer keeps going. Got enough time for one or two more. Um. Okay, Armadillo says, in your shop a while ago, you had a cabinet with some power tools. When did you use those? Um, no, I have, um, I have in the shop, I have a router. Actually, I don't know where my router is. Um, I have a, a, I have a belt sander, but it's broken. Um, I have a hand, uh, power planer. Um, and that's the power planer is probably the one I bring out more than anything else. If I do bring out power, power, um, because of shooting videos, I can spend a good chunk of the day flattening, smoothing large amounts of material for some of the bigger projects, or I can grab a power planer and get through it so that I can make videos faster. Um, and so that's, the power planer really is my one major concession to power tools in the shop. Uh, but every now and then I'll bring out, like I had the, the router, I flattened um, the big slabs for my table with a router um, that was just saving days worth of time. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, um, I'm trying to think. Oh, I have a, I have a DeWalt, uh, drill that I pull out from time to time. Um, that's about it. Most of the time I just find doing things the hard way to be more fun. Um, the odd time when it is seriously heavy time savings and I have a deadline to get a video out, that's when I pull out the power tools. So, yeah. What you got? Okay. So Uncle Redneck asks, when are you going to make a video on making a set of wooden Crocs you like to use? Crocs? I'm assuming he means the footwear. Oh, the clogs? <laughs> yes. Um, I, have, I have a video on actually carving these, and I would like to do a video on creating a new pair from scratch. Um, these were sent to me uh, by a viewer from Holland. He sent me the, the blank, and then I carved them and finished them off. Uh, they are fantastic for the shop, incredibly comfortable, um, and protect your feet so that things fall in and they're protected. Um, but I have thought about getting a, a chunk of poplar and carving my own from scratch. I um, just haven't gotten there, but one of these days I might. We'll see. Cool. You got yeah, much I more? Think, no, I, I think we're good. I think. Cool. Uh, Sorry if I missed it. I think that's about it for today. So um, next week we're going to be going back to the regular 7 o'clock uh, mm -hmm. Tuesday. And I'm not sure what we'll do, but we'll probably do some other joint. I've been liking doing this um, interesting joint work. So if you have some yeah, idea for that, let me know. Yeah, I think that'll about do it. So until next time, have a wonderful day. Oh, hang on. Now i got to find the screen to turn it off. Okay, here comes the button pushing time. All right, here we go. All right. Bye. Bye.